this talk was uh, supposed to be given by uh, GA shown uh, uh, right here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, today in the morning, she said she, she was not feeling very well. Uh, and so she asked me to, um, to, to give the presentation in her stead. So I apologize to everyone, you're stuck with me. Uh, I'm going to be using her slides and this is not going to be uh, not even close to uh, as uh, nicely polished uh, presentation as uh, she would have done. So hopefully you, you will all get to hear from the person who actually did the work uh, at some point. But in any case, I'll try to uh, pretend that I'm GA and, and, and give a brief summary of, uh, of, of her work here. So the, the topic uh, that we were uh, uh, investigating here was uh, how uh, cognitive boundaries uh, and are, are, are detected to structure uh, episodic memory formation uh, in the human brain. And all of the work that I'm going to talk about was done, uh, was conducted by GA and was done in collaboration with a couple of people, most notably uh, my good friend, uh, Uli Rutishauser, uh, uh, shown, uh, shown, shown here. Um, okay, so before I, I, I get into showing you some of the uh, cool data that the GA collected, uh, I want to uh, start by um, uh, discussing the notion that uh, it is now essentially possible to store our entire lives uh, in, in, in a hard drive. Um, and just as a back of the envelope uh, calculation, just to uh, consider the sense of uh, vision, uh, because it's somewhat easier to, uh, to calculate. Um, let's say that uh, we want to store everything we see in our, lifestyle, in our lifetimes. Um, let's assume that we have about 10 to the 6 pixels per second. The, the, number, the exact numbers here don't, don't really matter, and, and we can debate about how many pixels per second you actually want to store. But let's say we want to store 10 to the 6 pixels per second, and we want to store each pixel with uh, 3 bytes. So that means that um, we have about um, um, 256 uh, shades uh, for, for, for each uh, uh, color. And let's say that um, uh, we are lucky enough to live all the way to uh, 100 years old. Um, so that's about 10 to the 9 seconds. So all in all, everything we'll see in our lives amounts to about uh, 10 petabytes. Uh, of course, our life is not just uh, visual processing. Uh, there are lots of exciting sounds, uh, all the internal ruminating that, 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 we, that we do, uh, uh, olfactory sense, uh, uh, touch, uh, lots of other things that transcend uh, visual processing. But the main point I want to make is that it's not inconceivable that basically we could potentially store, uh, store everything. And yet uh, our memories are, are very, very far from uh, uh, this kind of uh, complete storage uh, of, of, of information. Um, our episodic memories are, are fragile, uh, they often deceive us, uh, and in fact, we forget most of what we see uh, uh, the, and, and most of what we experience. Uh, a large fraction of our lives uh, uh, we actually uh, uh, end up uh, forgetting. So we're very interested in trying to understand uh, how our brains distill uh, uh, information from our daily experiences to form uh, uh, episodic events and how these episodic events are defined uh, and, and what are the filtering mechanisms that condense and compress information uh, to form episodic memories. So the particular question that I'd like to focus on today is what defines an event? So our lives are, are of course, uh, uh, continuous. Uh, and yet most of our episodic memories are somewhat discrete. We tend to remember uh, particular events that are somewhat isolated from, uh, from, from other events in our lives. So there has to be some, um, some sort of um, uh, mechanism that will detect uh, boundaries uh, in, our, in, in our daily experiences. Uh, and, and I'm uh, trying to illustrate that here with these scissors, basically some, some sort of boundary in our continuous move, in our continuous uh, 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 live stream uh, that will limit the onset of one event and, 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 and give rise to the onset of another. So we set out to try to investigate uh, what defines an, an event, is spe specifically in the context of uh, uh, episodic memory. Uh, so we, we refer to this as, as, as cognitive uh, boundaries. Uh, that lead to the formation of discrete uh, mnemonic episodes. So here's the uh, flavor of the type of experiment uh, that, that we run uh, to try to uh, better understand uh, the formation of these uh, uh, episodic boundary bands. Um, so um, we work with um, 
subjects that were presented with uh, very short video clips, uh, about eight seconds uh, in duration. Um, and then after watching these, uh, these video clips, uh, in a random fraction of the video clips, they were asked uh, some uh, simple questions about the content just to make sure that they were paying attention and they had uh, uh, and they, they, they had actually um, seen uh, and, pay, and, 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 and attended to, to the contents of the video clip. And, and importantly, we had uh, base, uh, three different types of video clips. Uh, in one of the video clips, uh, there was no boundary. So this was uh, uh, a, a continuous uh, sequence that uh, lasted uh, for eight seconds. And what I mean by continuous is uh, just uh, that the transition between any frame and the adjacent one uh, was, was minimal, as, as illustrated uh, here. Uh, in the second category, uh, we had uh, what uh, we refer to as soft boundaries. So this is what the, the way typically uh, Hollywood movies are, are filmed, uh, where uh, every now and then you have a sharp transition between one frame and the next. Um, if you've never paid attention to this when you when you watch a movie, uh, next time you watch a movie, pay, uh, uh, just 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 uh, uh, reflect on what's actually happening, and and you'll see uh, that every three four seconds, basically in the movie, uh, Hollywood directors like to insert uh, a cut. And therefore, there's a transition. The, this, this, the narrative of the story is is basically continuous, um, but 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 the, at, at the at the visual pixel level, at least, uh, there's a major transition from one uh, one frame to the next. And we refer to these as soft boundaries. Um, to distinguish them from the third category, which we referred as hard boundaries. So these are cases where we simply took uh, two completely distinct uh, movies. And we just uh, concatenated together four seconds of the first movie and four seconds of the second movie. So we refer to this as a hard boundary because there is no continuous narrative between the first part and, and, and the second part. So after subjects uh, watched all of these uh, video clips, they, um, they were tested in terms of what they remembered about the clips uh, using two different tasks. Uh, in one task, uh, which we refer to as uh, the scene recognition task, uh, subjects were presented with one frame, a single frame, uh, and they were asked to indicate whether they had seen that particular frame during the video clips, uh, yes or no, that is whether the frame was old or new. So the, 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 we, we randomly either selected a frame from the video clips or another uh, uh, frame that, that they had not seen. So with 50% chance, the, the frame was either old or new. And the second test uh, was a time discrimination uh, task where uh, we presented two frames, in this case, two frames that were actually from the video clips, uh, and the uh, subjects had to indicate uh, which of the two had occurred first, whether the one on the, uh, on the left was first or the one on the, on, on the right was, uh, was first. Um, okay, in addition to that, uh, we also um, asked for confidence levels. So not only they had to say old or new, or left or right, but they also had to indicate in a, in a three point scale, uh, whether they were very sure, very unsure, uh, less sure or completely sure about their answer. Okay, so here are some of the behavioral results. Uh, so here I'm showing the results for the uh, scene recognition uh, task. Remember, they are shown one frame, they have to say whether it's old or new, chances 50%. So here's accuracy. So subjects performed uh, uh, with uh, an accuracy that's uh, slightly below 80% uh, uh, correct, mostly irrespective of the type of boundary, whether it was uh, a no boundary, a soft boundary, or a hard boundary. For all of these clips, uh, people were uh, um, uh, almost at 80% correct uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this task. Their reaction times are shown here. They're also very similar across the different video clips, uh, as well as the, uh, uh, as the confidence levels. Next, I wanted to show you performance as a function of the distance between the target frame and the previous boundary. So for all, everything that we're going to do comparing soft and hard boundaries, uh, we're going to, uh, in the no boundary condition, we're going to align everything to the middle of the clip, that is at four seconds, which is where most of the, which is where all the hard boundaries were and where most of the soft boundaries uh, were, okay? So we're aligning the target frames to the previous boundary or in the case of no boundaries to, to four seconds. 
So here we are showing uh, uh, performance uh, for all the, 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 the accuracy as a function of the time from the past boundary. So in the case of no boundary, there was no correlation. However, in the case of soft boundaries and hard boundaries, uh, there was a negative correlation, meaning that subjects remembered slightly better uh, those events that happened close to the boundary compared to those events that happened uh, uh, a few seconds after the boundary. So there's a, uh, these, these um, soft and hard boundaries uh, do seem to play an, a role at the behavioral level uh, in, in dictating what people will or will not remember. Okay, so now I wanna show you the behavioral data for the time discrimination task. Uh, so here's the accuracy. And, and here there was a, a difference between the different types of boundaries. So for the no boundary and the soft boundary conditions, uh, subjects were, uh, again, uh, somewhat below 80%, probably around 70% uh, uh, correct uh, in discriminating which frame uh, came first. But interestingly, in the case of the hard boundaries, uh, people were almost at chance. So it was very hard for people to discriminate the order of the two events uh, when there was no continuity in the in, in the narrative. So there's no logic basically to which to, to which frame comes first. And in this case, people were essentially uh, at, at chance. They also it also uh, took longer for subjects to try to recall uh, which frame uh, uh, came first. And also subjects had lower confidence uh, in these uh, hard boundary conditions. Okay, so now um, we uh, repeated all of these uh, uh, tasks uh, in uh, patients that had uh, invasive uh, uh, electrodes implanted uh, for clinical reasons. These are patients with pharmacological intractable epilepsy, and they're implanted with uh, uh, electrodes in order to, uh, to localize where the seizures are coming from for uh, potential surgical resection. So uh, we worked with uh, uh, neurosurgeons uh, that uh, implanted these uh, uh, electrodes. And what I want to talk about today is data that was recorded from this high impedance microwire. So there's uh, uh, this uh, depth electrode that's, uh, that, that's implanted. And through the lumen of this uh, uh, depth electrode, there are uh, uh, eight microwires that are passed through and that uh, these are high impedance microwires uh, that sometimes allow us to record the activity of uh, individual neurons. So we have a pre-implantation MRI, there's planning of where the electrodes are going to be targeted based on clinical uh, considerations. The doctors insert the macro electrodes, then they insert these micro electrodes, and then we have a post-implantation MRI uh, to try to localize where those, uh, those electrodes are. And this is one uh, particular uh, sample of one of these uh, very nice recordings that, that we've obtained. This is not necessarily typical. For many of these micro wars, we get absolutely nothing. That is, we get basically noise. But every now and then, uh, we get lucky and we get beautiful recordings of spikes of uh, individual neurons uh, uh, in the uh, vicinity of these, uh, uh, of these micro wire electrodes. So here's a sample of uh, the data that uh, the GA collected, uh, in, especially in these uh, uh, this, uh, um, seven different regions. And for, for the purposes of uh, today's talk, I want to focus on the medial temporal lobe, specifically in the recordings of 343 neurons in the hippocampus. Uh, neurons in the amygdala and neurons in the parahippocampus, uh, because we think that the medial temporal lobe might be particularly relevant for the formation of episodic memories and to delimit these uh, cognitive uh, boundaries. Uh, should time permit, I'll show you data from this uh, uh, for other regions as well. Uh, okay, so here's uh, uh, an example recording. This is uh, 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 an example from uh, uh, a single uh, uh, a single neuron. So what I'm going to show you now is the neural data aligned to these uh, boundary events. So what you're seeing here is um, a, uh, one, one point, um, uh, each of these dots corresponds to uh, uh, a single spike from this neuron. This is a raster plot. Each line corresponds to uh, one movie, uh, one, one video clip. So here, uh, these are not repetitions. Each video clip is unique. Subjects see each video clip only once. So here are the 30 video clips that had uh, no boundaries. Here are the 75 uh, video clips that had a soft boundary and 30 video clips that had uh, a, a hard boundary. And what you can see here is that uh, th this band here shows that there was an enhanced firing rate uh, from, from, from this neuron, both uh, in the soft boundary condition as well as in the hard boundary uh, condition, but not in the no boundary condition. Again, in the no boundary condition, time zero corresponds to four seconds, that is the middle of the clip. 
So this, this, this response was uh, quite remarkable and, and, and robust. Uh, as you can see here, this is this is the raw data. So you can see that almost in every single trial, uh, you see that there is uh, uh, this this neuron uh, fires uh, closely uh, after uh, the uh, uh, after the boundary. So we refer to this as a boundary cell, as a B cell. Okay. Uh, and now I wanted to show you um, an example of a different type of neuron that that the GA also found, and that's shown here. So this neuron uh, that she calls an event cell or an E cell uh, fires exclusively uh, during the hard boundaries, uh, but not for the other uh, uh, for, for the soft uh, boundaries. So even though at the visual uh, uh, level, there's a major transition from uh, one frame to the next, uh, this neuron only fires when there's a discontinuity in the narrative of the story and not in the uh, in the soft boundary case. Gabriel, can I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. And, and uh, so this is a relative to the boundary. So at the onset of the movie and the offset of the movie, what happens? Uh, great question. And I'm pretty sure that, that if that's not the next slide, it's coming up in, in a couple of slides. So if you can hold that, that that's, that's, a, that's a fundamental question. I, I'll, I'll get to that. And, and it's actually pretty mysterious, I think, but, but I'll, I'll show it to you. Uh, anyway, so we, we, we were worried that, that these were purely visual transitions that if you were to record from the retina, you may also see uh, large abrupt uh, changes, uh, particularly in the context of a neuron uh, like, like, like this one. And the question that Carlos, just, just to preempt what I'm going to show you in a couple of slides, uh, the question from uh, Carlos is quite apropos because uh, the fact that this neuron will not show a response at the beginning and an offset of the, uh, of the video clip uh, suggests to us that it's not just a pure uh, visual transition that, 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 we are, uh, that we're seeing here. And, and moreover, this particular cell uh, uh, in, the, in the E cells, uh, because they don't fire in the soft boundary conditions, uh, we, we think that this is not just a, a reflection of a, a visual change uh, between one frame and the next. We were still concerned that maybe hard boundaries are different from some soft boundaries. Maybe there's a larger change in contrast, a larger change in color. Uh, there, there may be many visual features that are distinct. So we spent quite a lot of time, uh, and, and if anybody's interested, I'll be happy to, to show you some of the results. We spent a lot of time uh, building models to try to predict and differentiate soft boundaries and hard boundaries. The short answer is that there is no obvious uh, change uh, uh, that distinguishes soft boundaries and hard boundaries in terms of low level visual properties or any Anything that we can easily detect with uh, any kind of computer vision uh, model. So we think that, that the main distinction has to do with the discontinuity in the narrative here, rather than the change in, in particular visual features. Um, okay, so uh, I think this is what's, uh, I think this is, uh, oh no, before I get to Carlos question. Uh, so, so I showed you one uh, example cell. So here the, I'm showing you the activity, uh, the, the average activity of 42 different B cells and 36 different E cells. Uh, all of them, so here's a color map. So on the, on, on the, on, on the right here, you see the, the, um, the, the, the color scale map. So yellow means uh, high firing rate, blue means low firing rate. So here you see the activity of all of these cells. Again, in the, in the B cell, they, uh, they respond basically uh, 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 aligned to the time zero, both for the soft boundaries and hard boundaries. For the E cells, uh, mostly uh, uh, firing is restricted to the, uh, to the hard boundaries, but not to the soft boundaries. Uh, here, here are the responses. Uh, here he's getting at, at, at Carlos' question. So we were interested in uh, what happened at the onset of the clip and the offset of the clip. Again, reasoning that uh, if we were recording the activity of a, a neuron in the retina, we may also see uh, large changes due to these, uh, these transitions. So here's the, uh, the, the responses of the B and, and E cells when instead of aligning, aligning them to, to, to the boundaries, here we align them to the onset of the clip and basically uh, nothing happened here. This is the, uh, now uh, uh, the uh, activity aligned to the offset of the clips. They're, they're again, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're basically throughout the visual system. There are many neurons that respond very strongly to uh, the onset of a stimulus as well as to the offset of the stimulus. And again, we don't see any obvious response uh, from, 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 from these cells. Uh, to the clip onset or the clip uh, offset, uh, in stark contrast to the responses aligned to these uh, uh, internal boundaries uh, during during the movie. Um, okay, so th this 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 was uh, I, I have to say that this was uh, quite 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 surprising to me um, because I I would argue that uh, I would contend that the 
onset of the movie is also some sort of uh, uh, episodic boundary, some, some, something happened. Uh, in fact, I would argue that's a, a change in the narrative as well. And similarly, I would make the same argument about the offset of the click. So I, I don't have a good explanation. This is the observation. This, these neurons do not seem to care too much or respond very strongly to the onset and offset of the clips, much to my surprise uh, and the surprise of uh, all of us uh, and, and, the, and the surprise of all the reviewers that actually uh, commented on this, uh, on this paper. Um, but, but, but somehow these, these neurons do not respond to this. There, there are lots of other neurons. It's not that we just don't, uh, are completely unable to detect uh, responses to the onset and offset of the clip. There are lots of other neurons that do respond quite vigorously to the onset and offset of the clip, just not, uh, not, not, not these ones. Uh, okay, so um, next, uh, oh yeah, so, so just, just to show the dynamics of the response, uh, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, on average, and again, these are uh, uh, non-overlapping populations of cells, the E cells and the, and, and, and the B cells, and uh, uh, on, on average, when we compare the responses to, to, to both types of uh, boundaries, uh, the, um, uh, the, the boundary cells uh, uh, seem to respond uh, earlier uh, uh, compared to the, the B cells to respond earlier than, uh, uh, than, than the E cells. Uh, okay, so here's uh, the latency, the, the, peak of, uh, the peak firing time uh, for the E cells is uh, almost 100 milliseconds later than, than, the, than the peak firing of the, uh, 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 of the B cells. Uh, again, all of these numbers, uh, 300 milliseconds and 196, 197 milliseconds, that's aligned to the, uh, to, to the boundary. Okay, so the, the last point I want to make is uh, we had, uh, remember I told you that we conducted this memory task. So after they watched all the video clips, we asked people what they remember uh, in the scene recognition task as well as the time discrimination task. So we can ask whether the activity of these neurons is predictive of whether the subjects will uh, get it right or wrong uh, for any one uh, video clip. So here's the, uh, the example B cell that I showed you before, and now I'm going to separate the trials into those trials that are subsequently correct or subsequently incorrect in the scene recognition task. Okay, so uh, here, here it is. Uh, remember that people, uh, subjects were about uh, close to 80% correct, so there are many more trials in the correct category compared to the incorrect uh, uh, category. Uh, and, and quite uh, remarkably, uh, the firing that we saw that's uh, aligned to these uh, uh, boundary events uh, was much more prominent and almost absent uh, in, the, in the incorrect uh, uh, trials. So, uh, so, so here's the, uh, uh, the, the average firing rate. Uh, uh, again, here you see the increase in firing rate. Uh, uh, in response to the soft boundaries and the, and, and the hard boundaries compared to the no boundary condition. And the empty bars here correspond to the incorrect conditions where you see that there's a, a, a much uh, uh, weaker uh, increase in firing rate with, the spread, with respect to the no boundary uh, condition. So somehow these, uh, these neurons are um, uh, show, show a distinction uh, the, the activity of these neurons during the encoding of the movie, that is during uh, viewing the movie, uh, uh, was uh, um, correlated with uh, subsequent uh, memory performance in the scene recognition task. This was not the case uh, for the for, for the E cells, um, but in the case of the E cells. Uh, what uh, GA realized was that there was a correlation between the timing at which the neurons uh, fired and the ongoing theta oscillations uh, and, and behavioral performance. So some of you may know very well that there has been extensive work, especially in the hippocampus, but also in, the, in, in other regions within the medial temporal lobe, showing that the specific phase at which a spike occurs with respect to the ongoing oscillations in the local field potentials in the theta frequency band uh, can be used uh, to decode uh, uh, information. Specifically in the, in the Rodin literature, uh, this, uh, this phase has been uh, strongly correlated with uh, the position of the animal uh, and, and has been used to, to, do, to decode uh, uh, the navigational cues uh, uh, for, 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 the, uh, for, for the animal. So what uh, GA uh, did was uh, compute the, um, for, from the same microwires, in addition to high-pass filtering and getting the spice, we can low-pass filter the data, get the local field potential, filter those local field potentials in the theta frequency band, and then align each spike to the ongoing local field potential uh, uh, oscillations and compute the phase 
of the spike with respect to the theta uh, um, uh, 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 oscillations. So that, that's what uh, uh, GA is showing here. So on the y-axis now, uh, you have the, the face of the spike uh, as a function uh, uh, of uh, uh, time uh, with, respect to, uh, with respect to the boundary as well. And we see that there was this uh, uh, concentration of, of, of spikes uh, somewhat near the, 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 the 180 degree uh, phase. And, and this effect uh, was uh, again most uh, uh, prominent for the correct uh, uh, trials versus the incorrect trials in the time discrimination task, but not in the scene recognition task. So these uh, histograms that you're seeing here is a distribution of the face of the spikes with respect to the uh, theta oscillations. Uh, uh, in the if, if there is no uh, uh, um, consistent information in the timing of the spikes, you would expect to see a, a uniform distribution, which is what you see here for the no boundary condition, which is also what you see here essentially for uh, all, all the incorrect trials. However, in the correct trials for the soft boundary case and the hard boundary case, uh, there is a, a, a more predominant concentration of the spikes uh, near the, the 180 degree uh, uh, phase. So the phase of the spike with respect to the ongoing uh, theta oscillations uh, correlates with whether subjects will subsequently uh, uh, get uh, uh, the time discrimination task uh, correct in the, uh, um, uh, in, 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 in the task, but not with the scene uh, recognition task. Uh, okay, so uh, we quantify this by uh, a typical metric, which is the mean resultant length. Basically, you can plot all the faces uh, uh, in a circle, uh, add up all of those, and compute the uh, the mean resultant length. If the if, if there's a, if all the faces are distributed randomly, the resultant of this vector addition uh, will be will be very small. If all the faces are are perfectly aligned, these vectors will 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 add up, and then we'll have a a, a large mean resultant uh, uh, length. And that's what we're showing here uh, uh, on the left. Uh, again, in the case of the no boundary, uh, we see that the mean resultant length is basically close to zero. Uh, in the incorrect trials, uh, here the empty uh, bars, uh, they are also uh, pretty, pretty low. And there's a stronger uh, mean resultant length, uh, both for the uh, soft boundaries as well as for the hard boundaries. And just to confirm, is the face at all aligned to the stimulus? I guess um, how does how does one get the alignment of the face and the boundary as well? Yeah, so 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 this is showing uh, uh, for, for for given a spike, uh, we can uh, ask wh where it is with respect to the with, with the boundary. Okay, yes. so, so that that's the x axis. Okay, and then at the same time for that for that spike, we can say what's what's the face of that spike with respect to the LFP. Uh, so that that that's what is being shown here. So for example. Of the spike. If, yeah, so, so this is this is this is a spike that happened, uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, 250 milliseconds before the boundary and, and it had a phase of, uh, uh, I don't know, 300 uh, degrees. OK, so that, that so, so here we're showing all the spikes that happened between uh, uh, minus 0 0.5 and, 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 and one second uh, and and the y axis is showing that. Uh, that, that. Okay. OK. And Gabriel, it, are these spikes? um the aggregate of several uh experiments or is this so are we looking at for each, each of these panels is that all the spikes uh pulled from all the experiments uh so uh, uh if, if you look at uh the this um so so the, this is a single uh this is a single example mm -hmm. so so there's no aggregate uh uh in in in, in here okay so, so, right so this is the time elapsed from the presentation of the stimulus uh time elapsed on so the, uh so, so the, this is a, a single a, a single neuron mm -hmm. uh, single microwire uh looking yeah. at, at 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 the the time from the uh from the boundary okay mm -hmm. so i'm not sure what you mean by this this, this is the boundary okay so yeah. this is the, the all the spikes are aligned to the to, to, to this boundary event mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and, and this is the phase. So then to quantify all of this, just to put a number to, to, to all of these, we compute this uh, mean resultant lengths. Okay, so this is just going to give you one number uh, for, this, uh, for, for, for this neuron, uh, indicating for each one of these different conditions, uh, uh, how, how much alignment there is of the spike with respect to, uh, with, with respect to, the, uh, to the theta phase. 
Uh, and then here we're averaging across uh, uh, across the different uh, cells to show the mean resultant length uh, for, uh, uh, for 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 all the uh, for all the B cells for each of the different conditions. That does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it's just that um, when I look at the plot, especially the correct for the hard boundary, uh, that resembles um, you know the the phase precession plots that we usually get when rodents are walking through a place field. Um, you know, it, it might just be coincidence, but um, there's this uh, seemingly, you know, progression as time advances that you get a, a, a smaller phase. Yeah, I, th I think let me let me see if I can annotate this. So, so first of all, I, I should say that all of this is uh, uh, directly inspired by by, by 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 your work and the work in Rodents, of course. Uh, I I think what you're talking about is uh, these basically. Uh, right. Exactly. I, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. I. I think. I think. I think that. That. That's. That's right. Uh, so. In. In this case. Um, th there is no. Uh, th there is no movement. There's no. Uh, uh, so. So. In, in your case, you would say this is uh, uh, as the animal is moving um, in the in the arena or in the maze. Uh, you. You see this type of uh, um, relationship, right? So in this right. case, uh, there is no physical movement. So you. You could argue perhaps that there is some sort of movement in cognitive space uh, uh, whatever that is right so uh, I, I agree i think i think this is this, this is quite interesting um yeah the, the, is, is that is that the comment you were making uh, uh, yeah and then yeah I, I'm, I'm trying to think exactly about the conditions right there's uh there's no movement uh and that's why my initial question was in reference to the stimulus again you know thinking about uh position for us but you know just trying to think well, about Again, again, I'm not. So the time zero here is the is, is the boundary event. Okay, so that that right. that's what we're aligning everything uh, to. So uh, we we could align all of this also to the to the onset of the clip and the offset of the clip. Uh, we may have done that. I I don't actually remember if we if we have or not. Uh, so we are always aligning to uh, to to the boundary events. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to to talk more about this. Uh, yeah, all, yeah. all of this was only uh, directly inspired by. Uh, by, by 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 the work in uh, in in, in Rollins for sure. Yeah. So th that that's mostly what I wanted to show you uh, in terms of the data. There are a few other analyses that I uh, that I didn't want to show. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to uh, to share the, the the paper, which is uh, now in uh, in bioarchive. So just to summarize, uh, these uh, event boundaries uh, uh, enhance the accuracy of recognition of uh, nearby uh, events. So the closer you are to the boundary, the easier it is to, to remember the events. The hard boundaries uh, also show uh, uh, lead to an impairment in the memory for the temporal order of the events. So when we have two events that are uh, uh, disconnected uh, uh, fr from, from each other, it's hard to remember the order uh, when, when there was a hard boundary uh, uh, in, in, in between. Uh, we showed that there are some uh, boundary cells that detect uh, sharp transitions uh, between adjacent events. We don't think that these boundary cells are, are purely, uh, you know, uh, visual uh, neurons, uh, because uh, we, we don't see them responding at the onset of the clip or at the offset of the clip, and uh, uh, we also cannot quite predict their activity directly from uh, properties of uh, uh, contrast color shape, etc. Perhaps even more strikingly, we have these uh, uh, event cells that detect uh, sharp uh, transitions when they're disconnected uh, with each other. And we think that these may be candidates uh, to go back to the very beginning of my presentation. Uh, these may be candidates to detect these uh, and segment our, our continuous narrative, our continuous uh, live stream uh, into, uh, into discrete uh, uh, events. So these event cells respond during these uh, disconnected transitions, but not during uh, during all uh, transitions and then the, the firing of the both the B and the E cells correlates with the subject's uh, memory performance in the case of B cells there was a correlation between their activity their firing rate and uh, and, and and performance in the scene recognition task in the case of the E cells uh, there was a correlate between the timing of their activity with respect to the ongoing uh, oscillations and uh, subsequent performance in the time discrimination task uh okay and that's that's all i wanted to say and again just to uh emphasize one more time all of this work that was done by uh ga and i am doing a 
um, just uh, uh, and, um, being an ambassador here and, and, and describing her work because unfortunately she couldn't be uh, here today.